All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. This week, I am switching up for you guys for two reasons. One, to highlight the work of a good friend, Pat Daly, over at thepatlife.org. He has recently completely stepped up his game with producing content. He's had people from Sally Fallon Morell to Dylan Scoscio, who is the other reason why I bring this to you today. He's had Veda Austin. He has had the most unbelievable guests in such a short period of time that I'm just amazed at how he booked everyone in and was able to chat, talk to everyone in such a short period of time. It's really, really amazing. And I actually reached out to him to ask him if I could mirror the interview that he had with Dylan Sicoccio because Dylan's also a good friend, good friend of the show. And we're gonna have him on really soon to talk about some of the things you're gonna hear in this podcast. But I think that what they covered in this one was so amazing that I really wanted to bring it to you guys because Dylan's work has really really changed the way that I view the world the way that I see things on kind of a daily basis and how I can kind of break down words I'm definitely not in the same caliber as him yet it's just he really produces the framework to dispel lies and get closer and closer to the truth and what I really love is that he never claims to know what the truth is it's just he's a master spell breaker and just someone who really has produced the, the groundwork and the framework to what is being spun to you as the truth and really kind of break down those barriers. So I'm really excited to bring this to you guys. Please go check out thepatlife.org and please head over to Amazon and buy every single book that Dylan has produced. They are absolutely foundational. I think everyone should have them and understand them. Check out his books, purchase them. It really helps him out and it really, really will help you out. I truly believe that. So without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Pat Daly and Dylan Scoscio. Welcome to the Pat Life Podcast. As always, I am Patrick. Been looking forward to this for an entire month. Uh, you all know who he is at this point. If you don't, you can go back and watch some of my older episodes. Go see him on other platforms like Crow Triple Seven, uh, Inverse Interverse Co- Podcast with Chance Garten. Um, you can see him on a few others. Rob's Rob Edwards Dig Within. Um, he's very particular with who he goes on with because he's spreading information and knowledge that is only for those who are willing to listen and do the work. Uh, as he says in his other book, Get Mad or Get Realistic, it's about time we all start taking ownership, start doing the hard work that uh, that's going to help us live a better life that we always bitch and complain about. So he is doing that with these books, Spirit World. Uh, you all know him, Dylan Sicoccio. What's up, man? Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me back. And uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things I've noticed about our culture and our society in general is we all want the results, but we don't want to work for them. And um, really the success to any endeavor is going to be do the work. But yeah, let's let's dive in, man. So I got the book right here. Uh, This is the fourth uh, installment of a what now it's going to be a five part series as of now it might be more uh, this is spirit world uh, a god's acre for winds of the soul um, you know real quick do you want to just maybe and I know we have a, a whole topic at hand but just quickly describe what is what do you mean by a god's acre uh, just so just a quick taste of why you would name the book that well that title if I were to translate it to like modern uh, vernacular, it would be a graveyard for words. There you have it. There. So, and for those who want to know more, he explains it in the book. I just wanted to give a little taste so people can be like, how is that even a parallel? How can you connect the two? Um, and we're about to dive into some of that here today. So there's a lot in this book. It goes into so many different pieces. It's all connected, though. That's the beauty of it for me as a storyteller. I love how things connect. Uh, a story is always going to find itself full circle. Um, but we're going to dive into a specific part of what your book is talking about. And that point is Troy. Everybody to some degree knows of the Trojan War, the Trojan Horse, Troy in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people only can think of Brad Pitt, 
<laughs> and that's about as far as most people will go with Troy. Uh, or the Real quick, I took that kid, uh, that guy who played his like cousin or whatever gets killed. Garrett Hedlund? I used to, yeah, yeah, I used to play poker. There was like a poker game in Holly, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, like, like the border of like Beverly Hills and West Hollywood. Mm-hmm. At like some casting director's house, I used to take that dude's money because he'd always be smoking at the table, high as fuck with his manager. There you go, man, dude. But uh, you know, he's a, he's a no, cool yeah, guy. No, he seems like a pretty pretty laid back dude who's just trying to make his way in the business. So I mean, he's been in quite a bit though too. Um, but yeah, well, this is before he was blown up. This was like oh, gotcha. way before. Yeah, no, he's he, yeah, he's a good actor, man. Um, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about this, dude. So where where do you want to start with uh, with Troy in? Where do you want to take us off? Well, Troy was claimed to be a place on Seven Hills, just like Rome, which leads me to think it was originally astrological. Um, though many places on different continents have been named after it. Uh, even like um, I have a fi- one of my bloodlines from uh, Southern Italy, their last name means from Troy. And uh, uh, the original one, uh, the reason I go into this astrotheological symbolism is because it was near a place called Mount Ida, Ida. And so its topmost peak is Gargarus. And it was mentioned in the Iliad. And so the gods assemble on the sides of the north in a stone circle called Temenos. And that's a sacred enclosure that is known as Gilgal, also a stone circle. And so this ought to be a clue regarding a, uh, characters' names like in other uh, literature, like Gilgamesh, right? Which, if you look at it etymologically, would be to draw out of the sacred enclosure. And so what does the stone circle, the circle of Petra, the Lord, symbolize? Well, according to Joshua 14, uh, 419, Gilgal is located at the 10th of the first month in the extremity of East Jericho. Now, I will remind people the word Jericho comes from the Hebrew Yareach, which is the uh, root, uh, sorry, which is the moon. And it also has Yah in it, J-E or I-E, that's going to be God. And these 12 stones, which they have taken out of the Jordan, uh, and the Jordan is the river of the sun etymologically, Dan pertains to judgment also, while your is basically or, A-U-R, and O-R, the sun. And this would be an equinox. And so anyways, they have taken out of the Jordan, hath Joshua raised up in Gilgal, a sacred enclosure. I will remind people that Joshua is a play on the word savior, the son, Yahshua, Yasha. And you see this with Jesus. You know, people often say, oh, well, Jesus's real name is Yeshua. Uh, That just means savior. It's a play on Yasha. And if you were to spell that out in Greek, I'm sorry, in Hebrew, it'd be I-S-O or I-S-E, yud shin He or yud shin uh, ayin. Now, So you have 12 stones, right? So what could 12 stones encircling a sacred place correspond to? Now that you'll see that in Meru symbolism, right? As we were just talking about Troy, Ida, Mount Ida, the north. On dry land, Israel, quote unquote, the sun, right? Because Israel is uh, the Phoenician name for the sun. A lot of people don't know that. Um, It passed over this Jordan equinox, right? And or the river of the sun, however you want to, you know, some it's it's going to be pertaining the two river in this symbolism. You always see it with two rivers, uh, a lot of the times, and this is because Jehovah, the sun, again, your God, dried up the waters of the Jordan at your presence till you're passing over, as Jehovah your God did to the Red Sea, which He dried up at our presence till our passing over. Anytime you deal with passing over. You're talking about the equinoxes, right? And the very word Hebrew, if you, uh, and I'll go into this uh, a little bit in book five, but if you look at the etymology of the word Hebrew, it pertains to those who have passed over. And I've gone over this in previous books, uh, and I've gone over this on previous podcasts. It pertains to 
uh, degrees of initiation after passing over Hebraic degrees, if you will. And that's a hint at what I'm talking about. Um, so going back to Rome, Rome was built upon seven hills to imitate Babylon. And Constantinople was also built upon seven hills for that reason. And so it indicates that there is a system of religion underlying their motives. It doesn't matter what your opinion of that is. It doesn't matter if it's real or fake at this point. What matters is, is there is an observable system. So every single person that's listening to this without having a reaction can at least agree that there is a, sim uh, a symbolic system that's used as the cult goes from place to place. Now, Troia or Troy means three places. Ilion, which would be um, Iota, uh, Lambda, Iota, Omicron, Nu in uh, Greek, that's an archaic name for Troy, hence Homer's Iliad, which uh, could also be called Troia or Troy. So your ability, when you see these words, to recognize their similarity in the history Troy, Ilion, Ilium, Iliad, Ilios, in their authentic pronunciations, that will key you in on what you're looking at and what the Iliad is really about. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, yeah, feel free to jump in. On Homer, like if, as you put in the book too, the Ohm, like the H, you know, taking the H yeah. out, you have Ohm. So that's just pertaining back to India, you know, and their ohms and things like that. I just think that's another layer of it too. The the myrrh, you know, if you break it up that way as well, you have myrrh, you're dealing with Mary, myrrh, you know, so it's just like there's layers upon, there's just Good layers one. upon layers. And it's just, you know, when you break it down, you start to realize to your points constantly, time and time again, are we dealing with real people? Are we dealing with just mythology? Are we dealing with characters to describe different things? Like you keep saying, and I don't want to go too far off track, but dealing with a lot of this, wa this, this no, water you're not off track and at all. sun being encoded in almost every word and every character and every piece of uh, of this literature that's out there. As you just said, like you're dealing with the Jordan, dealing with the sun in the waters. You're dealing with even like Bacchus. You're dealing constantly this ARR, which is water, or uh, EU, which is water. Euphrates, things like that. I just think that's so fascinating because you see it time and time again. Um, and then the question for those is, well, why is it there? But um, anyway, I'll let you take it back. Well, you couldn't have come in at a better time um, with Homer because he's attributed to writing the Iliad and it's composed of the words om the sun, as you said, you actually did mer, which is, which is brilliant because, uh, that would be the, uh, like mermaid. It's always of the sea, but it's also ir, which is the beginning of a cycle, the spring of a year, the morning of a day. And so that would be the sun in Aries. And it's claimed that the Oya or the OIA in Greece and what uh, Tripoli used to be, O-E-A, they're named after that phonetic, which means one or unique. And Troia means three in one, just like Trinity, just like Tremuti, right? That's where the Trinity comes from, Tremuti, three gods, one form. Now, there are places with similar names in Africa and Asia all over the world. Um, and the triune symbolism leads, without exception, to the acceptable year of the Lord, uh, and so the gods assemble on the north side of the zodiac or the sacred enclosure of the 12 stones because the stars of the north never go into Egypt or below the horizon or cross the rivers of the equinoxes or the equator. So that's why the stars of the north are looked at as gods, eternal, right? And the ones that go below the horizon are the ones that go into Egypt. And so this is part of the reason why uh, our culture is so stunted, is we are looking at things that are astrotheological stories and accepting them as history. And they don't understand that Egypt was not a historical location, just like Israel was never a historical location. I'll wager my soul. 
If you're going to contradict me, put your fucking soul on the line and let's get it going. Because you will not find this stuff in any historical context. It's all a product of the modern era, right? And so these stars, these gods, they spin around Polaris all year round. And as long as you can recognize their positions, you know exactly what season you're in, or at least approximately what time of year it is and which direction is north. And so another name for Troy, or encoding it, is that word Tripoli. And it's now spelled, uh, it used to be spelled T-R-I-P-O-L-Y, now it's spelled T-R-I-P-O-L-I. And Ilion, I-L-I-O-N, is Elion, E-L-Y-O-N, the highest god. So Troya is three in one, God the most high, which is what lions are named after. And that's, you know, what do lions correspond to? The sun. What does the Trinity correspond to? The sun. Right. And it just makes me think, uh, just seeing all these connections uh, growing up and as well as when I was in New York City, seeing how many uh, lion statues are everywhere. And you see that symbolism all the time. And I just remember, even just like I said, growing up and in, in going to, into the city of Chicago, you just see them uh, all over. And you're like, what What does that mean? Why is it there? And now with this information, you know, oh, it, it all pertains back to the sun. And it really does, man, because as you show time and time again in the books, these comparisons. And it's not just the sun, but what's really fascinating, and you show this in the book, is that all of these characters are showing you know, basically the sun at different points of the year. And that's what's that, that one was the moments that blew my mind. So um, I don't know if that gets too far off track for what we're talking about, but you're saying- No, it doesn't at all. It, it's all related. So there's no going off track here because this system, you know, it's funny because Chance and I were just talking about this uh, last night off the record. We were just going back and forth, like how the system is constantly returning to itself. It's like an eternal bloom but then also an eternal return. Mm -hmm. And and what I was saying when I was having this conversation was I don't subscribe to the, like him and his buddies, they do their own syncretism thing. And the way they take it is it's yes and. And while I believe, or I can observe that human thought and consciousness is constantly yes and, you know, yes and, I totally disagree with that when it comes to trying to figure out a symbolic system because in the early days of the system, it was extremely rigid. And so the um, the priests, the church, if you look at the early symbolism, the reason it's crude is because you were only allowed to use certain colors, certain symbols that way. And it would, it would things would be introduced at a very slow, gradual rate so that those symbols mean something and they don't get lost and people using it casually to attach to other things. And the reason we're so fucked up now is because in the common era, when I say the common era, you know, like the last 2000 years, you have everybody and their brother coming in and doing their own thing with it, especially the alchemists. You have them taking all the names of the sun and then reassigning them to names of the planets. And so this happens between the second century BC and like the first century AD. And so now you have planets that are named after the sun, Jupiter. Saturn, Mercury, Venus, Mars. These are all old names of the sun without exception. And the only people that don't, don't understand that are linguistically and symbolically illiterate. And you should ignore them because they're putting out a bunch of nonsense when it comes to this stuff. And that's why I wrote these books in the first place because too many people are leading you astray. And I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just because they're reading a bunch of modern shit and then they're regurgitating all the modern shit. And what makes my work exceptional is I don't really touch anything from them. I go back as far back as I can go and I do the work and I do it through language and symbolism from cultures all over the world. And then I put it together and show you my journey. And so the Spirit World series is basically the path that I've carved that you can go look at and then research every single word that you come across that's foreign or whatever it's like a tree. Just go follow right. those branches and see where it goes. And and you might be able to piece together more important stuff than I could. Well, one of the things that you did really fast and that I thought was super fascinating, and I'm going to butcher, uh, you're going to have no, to help me out here, it. but is um, showing that, you know, whether it be Greek or was it Latin, where we're seeing that 
the the quote unquote first language that was built off of had more um, letters than the latter religions or cultures, which, and maybe again, I'm having it backwards, but you're ultimately, your point is, is saying, how does one have more than at first? And then it's losing them as they go. It's not the other, you know, the other way around. Do you want to, you know what I'm talking about? Can you maybe just clarify? Yeah, it's, 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 it's really frustrating as like, when you're trying to figure out what's going on, you're basically being told that just from like the status quo, and, and I'm not diminishing this status quo because a lot of these people are extremely well uh, learned. So really quick, the old languages in Italy, specifically the Etrurian or the Etruscan, however, whatever you want to call them, they were called both the Etruscans or Etruscans. I call them the Etruscans because the SC is like an SH in, in Latin. Um, and then you other cultures called them the Etrurians, or they were also called the Etrurians, and some people, the Greeks called them Tyrrhenians. And this is interesting because Tyr has, is going to have that uh, lord, right? Just like you'll see in Thor or any, you know, all these other gods with that T U R, uh, T S A R, you know, Sar, Sur. It's all going to pertain to go back to India, Surya, which is the sun, the lord, the rock. Anyhow, the, the language of the Etrurians is similar to the Sanskrit, the, the, whatever that was, both in the words they share and both uh, in the way their sentences were structured. The problem with that is like, I think the Etrurian language only has 13 letters and the Sanskrit we have today is... It's got like over 50, I think it's 52 letters, but don't quote me on it. Look that up yourself. But some of them are double letters and stuff. So people have pointed out when you remove all the double letters and all the extra stuff, the Sanskrit also has the same basically 22 uh, letters, whatever, as a lot of the other alphabets. Um, but what I wonder is how is it possible for a language to only have like the Phoenician which is basically Eturian, all that stuff, which comes from whatever Egypt was when that collapsed. How do they only have 13 letters, yet they're from an, a language that has more letters? And I just don't, I don't see how that's possible. Um, but in any event, when you look at like, whether it's the German language, every language, you know, west of Asia shares like hundreds of words with Sanskrit. So... There is a thread. There is a system. And um, if you were to follow that trickle down, you would get Sanskrit, Etrurian, Latin, Italian. Go in that order. Um, and I spoke about this with Chance. I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe what happens because once you have a language that is made common, people are going to do their own thing with it. And so grammarians will improve it, but the common folk will... Uh, degrade it with like uh, like the common vernacular and stuff, and it won't follow rules. But the interesting thing about Sanskrit is it's unique in the sense that it is the only language that follows its grammatical rules. And if you want to get more into that, you know, listen to my latest podcast with Chance over at Interverse. It was called Universal Language. But uh, hopefully that was kind of sussing out what you were talking about. Anyway, I just wanted to just quickly just explain that to people just to show you that as you're writing these books, you're showing these and demonstrating to these logical questions that anyone should be asking is saying, again, hey, if we're following these timelines that we're told, this makes no logical sense. Why is this a case? And then obviously you give your points and your opinions on, hey, man, could it be that obviously there's uh, there's uh, some nefarious things going on or just they're leading us astray. But anyway, let's get back to talking about Troy here. Well, and and oh, just, yeah. just to just to like at, talk about that for a little bit, like it's it's really easy to default to oh they're leading us astray but you have to remember that most languages are childs or children of circumstance so it a lot of this language the reason it's shared everywhere is because you have these phoenicians and these maritime admiralty or like empires that are going all over the world and so their languages are going to be based on necessity and it's going to take things from different cultures and bring them back and so that's why you know, these languages that ultimately descend from those maritime empires 
going into English and Latin and stuff like that, they're the best languages because they are an amalgamation all over the world. They're universal. You know, the people who say like uh, English is like a language that was designed to enslave you. And it's just like, that is the truth community. Like th these people, there's a lot of poison in this space. And I'm very disappointed in what has become the truth community, what, what's become of it over the last 10 years to a point where I don't watch anybody in it anymore. And I don't, I don't consider myself a part of it. I just do my own thing because it's gotten so uh, emotional that there's no common sense when people are analyzing things. It's like, God forbid you just think about what it'd be like in a, in a life situation where you don't have the means of con convenient communication. There's no like messenger system. There's no postal system. You're getting together with people you don't know from all over culture, all over the world to do trade and to go on adventures with to make money because everybody's trying to make money, you know? And that gets into a lot of the reason why they had to hide places like America, why they had to, the Phoenicians had to hide places like Britain because that was their treasure. Because, you know, if, if the Carthaginians, all these people, the, these are all parts of like the, that Phoenician system. If they told their people about all these other locations, what they risk then is their own population hightailing it the fuck out of there for greener pastures, right? That's like one of the allure that was so amazing about America is everybody was coming here to plot their land, you know, get that land and start, you know, yeah, it's hard living, but it's free. It's away from the frigging crown. And so that's what you see when you look at history, why they're hiding certain shit, there's always a reason for it. They're not just like diabolical people who like uh, just do shit for the sake of it. It's always going to be power based financially, you know, all that stuff influence. It's, it's, there's always a reason to the, to the madness. So I don't know how I got on that tangent, but I did. Get me back on track or I can, I yeah, can start to, going back to Troy. Yeah, yeah go back to Troy because I'm getting, like I said, this noise and I want to make sure that you take the, the the helm of this shit, man. Take control of it. And you talk about that in your book anyway, uh, the mass and the, the helm. So I'll let you yeah, go. Yeah, isn't that wild how like if people, so all ships are designed to look like the Yoni and the Linga. But uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about that on an upcoming podcast, so I'm not going to get into that symbolism because I want to make every podcast I do unique. But um, take it with Troy, man. I'm going to. Uh, so basically, when you have this three in one symbolism, you're looking at an old name for Bacchus, Triumph, right? And so that would be spelled in Greek. Uh, well, no, it's the same. It's the same word, basically, T R I. I mean, I guess it would look like uh, O-M-P-H instead of U-M-P-H, but it's the same word. And it just means, again, tri being three, omf being omphalos, which has a sacred om, and it means navel. Again, one of those things co corresponding to the womb, to the yoni. And so yak, which would be I-A-C-C-H, is uh, identified with John or Johan. And when you see in the mystery schools, that's how they spell Bacchus with the I, A-C-C-H. Um, so corresponds to John, Johan, and that's hence the reason people named Jonathan are called Jack for short. John or Johan, you'll see in the first, the root of that word, you'll see yo, or which looks like I-O or Joe. Same with like Yosef, all that stuff. So that's why you get the Roman expression, yo, yo, triumphe. And then Trojan or Trojan, uh, there's multiple ways to spell that. You could sp also spell it T-R-O-E-A-N. You could also spell it T-R-O-Y-A-N. That has Yan in it. Whether it's you're doing it with a J or an I, it doesn't matter. I-A-N. Uh, that's going to be just like uh, Babylon. It's going to correspond to the winter or January, right? Janus, Yan, right? So like you have Brahma, again, you'll have in Rome, Bruma. It's the same effing word philologically. That's why you celebrate Brumalia at the winter solstice. This symbolism is 100% not debatable. It's not deniable. And so the Trojans would be the, if you were to look at this from like a astrological perspective, they would be those Northern constellations that don't ever set. 
or in other words, the immortals that gather around Mount Meru or Mount Ida. And so a gentleman named um, Franklin, he also aligned with my thoughts. Uh, and I, I came to this stuff before I found uh, this gentleman's quotes, but it's pretty cool seeing it from him. And he said, the gods are Marupa, which would be Meropes of Homer, and signify in Sanskrit, lords of Mount Meru, the North Pole of the Hindus, which is a circular spot and the stronghold of the gods. So it is called Ila, I-L-A, or in a derivative form, Eliam or Ilium. And so there is a triad, and in parentheses, Troium, of towers dedicated to three gods. Now the Trojans are styled divine and uh, Athanati, which means without or the absence of death. And so that means immortals. They are Meropis and came from the place where the sun stables his horses. The gods and giants at each renovation of the world fight for the Amrit or beverage of immortality. And that would be nectar. And also for the beautiful uh, Laishmi, uh, which would be Helen. Laishmi. Uh, she's also called Helena. In Sanskrit, all these derivations, Meropes for Merupa, Eliam or Ilium, Troyum or Troya, Helena or Helen. The Greek would be Eleni. They're all the same and they point to the same thing. And so the story told with some variations and the Trojan War happens soon after the flood of Deucalion. And he's in Sanskrit, that would be Deva Kala Yavana, but pronounced Deo Kalium. So for those who've never heard of Deucalion, I'll spell it for you. It's D-E-U-C-A-L-I-O-N. And that's the Greek version of Noah. You want to chime in, Pat? The sound is still a little bit dicey. I don't want to... You're, yeah, no, I just want to, yeah, no, yeah, just keep wanna, going, dude. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I love it. I'm, I know the pages. Now, you'll also see people talking about horse symbolism, whatever. Um, you can go back to, uh, like, some of the first tribes in ancient Britain, and you will see horses, a horse on the back of that coin. And there is symbolism there. But I'm going to get into that with book five. But just, you know, for you to look into look into the first coins, the first tribes of the ancient Britons on the record, you know, all of this stuff can be traced. Um, and so, wait, oh, sorry, let me get one thing in real quick. And this is total random, but it's it's total sync. I just had Veda Austin on talking about water. And she says a lot of people who've been doing their own t like studies with water have been getting horses in the water like visuals of like, no, without question, it's a horse in the water. So the fact that that's happening and people just randomly reaching out, doing what she's been showing, like, I don't know why I keep getting horses, like without- You got evidence of this? She does. Like physics? She does. I want to see the, I don't want to be associated with it unless we can bring some physical yeah, yeah. evidence. I'll make sure, I'll, I'll ask her to send over some visuals of this horses if she- Because I don't, yeah. I, I'm not, I'm, I know like this pisses people off a lot about me, but I don't go along with anything that people just shout out. It's not yes and for me. Yeah. If it's true and you got the evidence, I'll get on board, but I don't, I've never, you know, I, I can't like co-sign any of that. Oh no, I, I'm not saying that it's 100%. I don't have it with me, uh, but I just thought that was interesting because that, that made me think of that. But I, I'm right where you are with it. And, you know, like you said, let me see it to believe it or let me read it rather even too. Um, but yeah, do you want to, do you want to maybe, is there a, a point you want to take it with the Noah or do you want to maybe talk about the different, Variations of, of Rome, Rama, things like that to show, or uh, where where were you thinking? Um, because I could also I'll bridge it. Okay. I'll bridge them. Right. I'll bridge them. So um, if you look up on like old coins from like Gnosos Greek, you're gonna see the sevenfold city. So even in like this book, it's called that chapter is called the sevenfold city. Now there's just the labyrinth, right? These streets are or, or walls of Troy or Rome. They're spiraling from Mount Meru. And so why do they choose Mount Meru? Well, if you look at the North Pole, where is it for me? It's this way for me. So if you look at the Zodiac North Pole as its apex, you're going to see what looks like the shape of a mountain. Okay. And so that's a symbol. When you see these spirals, the spira, uh, it's going to look like the motions of heaven. And this is the origin of the circuits 
in the Latin circus being called Euripi, from what I've read anyway. Now, I can't confirm all this yet because uh, it's they're just claims, but I have seen them, like from old documents and whatnot, that the Clauci Maxima, which were basically sewers that were found under the uh, under Rome, and they were used to like you know some people say they were originally sewers from whatever the first city was, and you know afterwards they were used as like secret passages so like the Roman armies could move through the city without anybody knowing they were mobilizing. Um, but in any event, some people say they were sewers, the great sewers, whatever. But I've also seen that the claim that no, 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 they were actual labyrinths because Rome is based on the same symbolism that Troy is. And if Troy was a real place, this is where I'm at. I don't subscribe to Troy being a historical place. The story is too littered with astrotheology, but let's just cater to that. If it is, it is 100%, in my opinion, where Rome is. And Rome is just built on top of it. And so in any event, it was claimed that there was seven Euripi, right? Obviously corresponding to the seven planets, which are all named after motion. Now, they became known as narrow channels of water, the singular word being Euripus. And so um, in Latin, I got this from Cicero. Uh, it said, Ductus aquarum quos ili nilos et Euripus vocant. And so that means, or the water courses, which they call the Nile and the Euripus. Now keep in mind that Bacchus was named after water in motion, hence Bach being a stream in German. Now, uh, I can't, there's a Greek tragedian, and his name is Euripides. And so he's a performer of the Gospels, right, which are goat songs, or depending on how, you know, I've seen people uh, tran uh, claim the etymology of Gospel also means song of sorrow, but they're using Irish language to do it, Highland language. I can't tell you. For me, I'm, I'm with the, the goat song um, because... You have tragu, goat, odi, song, tragodi. But then you also have odine in Greek. Odine is pain, sorrow, anguish. So it is built in there, that song of sorrow, but also the tragu is undeniable in my opinion. Um, but the tragedies are all allegories for the sun or um, like they would, perf the performer so when I, when I see Euripides, right, is that a performer who's named after the circuits or channels of the luminaries, given that tragedies basically convey the gospels or the goat spells? I don't know. The songs of Odin or Odin, right? You see that? It's all in the same, uh, all in this language. It's, it, the system is undeniable. It's just a matter of whether you can prove the exact creation of it. And so that's why I, because the writing, the writing, the documents, however they did this, you're not going to get the, the original ways they did all of this stuff. So you have to decide if what you're looking at is authentic and you're looking at a system, or if you're just elaborating on it and doing the yes and thing. What I try to tell people is to give it like three strikes. If you find certain things that line up symbolically, it could be a coincidence, right? But when once you get past a certain threshold of having the same symbols, it becomes mathematically impossible that it's coincidence. So, Bet, oh, go ahead. I can hear you coming oh, up. Yeah, sorry, that, that was an accident. But um, it's just even talking about you were making a point of using uh, even logic in your book. You were talking about the asterism that is occurring and you're looking at it like, oh, it's coming from the Greeks and it's going, well, where they're located, you can't. If you're looking at it astral, like in, you're not going to see what supposedly they're documenting because it's not available there at that time or ever. Um, so logically, I mean, you have to know this information, but you address that and point it out. It's going, okay, well, if this is coming from the Greeks, they wouldn't be able to see this, this, these constellations or this, this yeah. astral theology. So it's like there's no possible way that they could have created. It has to come from somewhere else where it is available. Especially because you can only go so far, so far back and trying to understand mythology from the Greeks before the names and stuff don't make sense. And you need to know Sanskrit for the story to, for the symbolism to, to, to bloom or to unveil itself. And that's the problem is you have people who 
are not familiar with language, are not familiar with culture or history or how this system works, and they're brilliant people not knowing what they're looking at and not knowing how to look at it. And so that's my goal is to help these people who are otherwise brilliant look at things through a different lens so they don't make the, the mistake of trying to figure out something uh, where it fits in the re real world when it was an allegory to begin with. And it was a stolen allegory from the Chaldeans. They literally stole another culture's uh, astronomical allegories and repackaged it and called it their fucking history. And then they fed it to the masses and the masses are, you know, they're using sorcery because they're creating these egregores. And so now the masses are using their own imaginations and these egregores that are just basically an advanced version of sigil magic to, to do things. And I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying you're using magic. And so it's claimed that these major cities like Rome and Troy, they all had labyrinths built under them. Labyrinths. Sorry, that's a tough word for me. And that's what the sewers actually were. And for me, when you start seeing these sevenfold labyrinths, whatever, the spirals, all that stuff, it's likely astrotheological symbolism. Troy had Peter, um, Pergamus, which is shaped like uh, a pyramid, which could be mirroring the shape of the heavens, perhaps like Miro. Uh, but also Pergamus, almost the same word, is cancer. If you go look at the, the, the Bible and the Asiatic churches, that's what uh, Pergamos represents. And uh, They have the Pyrrhic War dance that you talked about. Yep. I don't know, is that and, that relationship there? I, I can't recall, but... Well, the relationship is that it's the, the Trojan War dance. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I can't make the connection to Pergamos. Though it does, does have that, like, phonetic affinity, but I wouldn't make that claim. Until, you know, if stuff revealed itself. But like the pyramids of Egypt, they might be remnants of these ancient allegories built in the shape of what they presume the sky to be. Now, that doesn't mean this is actually how the world works or how reality is. You just have to look at this is what they thought it was. And it changes over time. That's why these cults are always wrong. If there's one thing you can get from me, just remember these people have always been wrong. And I'm not here to make claims about reality for the viewer. I'm here to show you a system so that you can defeat its presumption over you. If I were to boil down what the point of my work is, is so that you can defeat the presumptions that all authority has over you because they're using allegorical symbolism, claiming it as history and claiming a connection to that fake history and why they are qualified to rule you. Anyways, Going back to what that like symbolism, what they presume that sky to be, this is likely what you see with that sevenfold cities and their circuits called um, Aguiae. And so Apollo Ergates built the walls of Troy in a square uh, as a seven streeted city called uh, Polis uh, Yereguia. And so this creates the cube symbolism, hence Aguileus, which means he of the street having the symbol of a cube. Um, let me read this Greek. So that would be schema uh, tetragonon. And so Aguienes, uh, Aguiens uh, is an epithet. Oh, let me spell that in Greek for you. It would look like A-G-Y-I-E-N-S. Uh, that's an epithet of Apollo, the protector of the streets, public places, and entrances of homes. This is why you, uh, going all the way back to like Egypt, you'd have obelisks that were in the front of temples, right? They would show you what that would symbolize what that temple is. An obelisk was also kept in front of the doors of homes to symbolize Apollo. And so he's also called um, Apollunas, or, and uh, I've seen people make this connection, Abulu, meaning gate in Babylonian. So I would ask, is Ergates an English-speaking person's way of saying gate of the sun? Because er is going to pertain to the sun, uh, the sun and gates. It's right there in the word. That would be something that's more um, speculative, though. I wouldn't make the claim. Uh, are we looking at lies constructed by the British Empire? I don't know. There's a lot of... I've, pe I've seen people make all kinds of interesting claims that this stuff is like a product of the Middle Ages. And that's really what, that, what was going on there. Is they were like literally redoing history to cover up for the past deeds. 
I would also say abulu, right? Meaning gate in Babylonian also sounds like abuelo, which is grandfather in Spanish. And so is this like a hint at the, the Janus, the Buddha, old man symbolism of the year? I don't know. But you have it, the guard of the gates, the father of time, Kronos. Uh, that's always going to be pertaining to the sun in winter or the beginning or the end and beginning of the year. Absolutely, man. And just to, to your point about the, the Middle Ages, um, I don't know if you have followed that guy, Awar. He's just basically trying to do what you're doing with in regards to the the architecture of these times of, you know, considered as you were saying, the Tartarian, which is we've shown that is it's false in many ways. And he's basically saying the same thing, but he's his whole narrative and his story is going based off of being on these locations, looking at it, doing the research, getting to, to source documents is saying like something happened in the Middle Ages, like around that same time that you're speaking about. The problem with AOR is he's symbol illiterate. So he's doing what I think every, like think he so? is doing that great. Yeah, he doesn't even know what the papal keys mean. True. Yeah, no, he's he, symbol illiterate. But I love his, I love that he's going to the locations and doing it. That's what I wish I could do. I don't have the support to do that, but get him spirit world, get him, get him brought up to speed. So when he knows, when he's looking at these, uh, secret symbolisms and these old churches and shit that he's going to, he actually knows what he's looking at. But, uh, yeah, no, he's, I, I like him. I just, yeah, there's a lot. He comes across that He doesn't even know what he's looking at. And it's sad. Yeah. That's what, this is what I'm saying. Otherwise brilliant people who don't know what they're looking at. That's what I'm harking back to. And I wasn't even thinking of him when I said that, but now that you brought him up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just, but I do like him. I, I like his videos. Well, I'm, it's great. I'm trying to get him on the show. So we're kind of back and forth. So that's the thing is if, you know, just it, it's, it's again, not to the same extent, but he, like you said, he has boots on the ground being able to look at these different locations, yeah. which again, it's showing as you just made clear, not bashing anybody is just going, we got to work together. We have to get him up to speed on certain parts where maybe he has something, Hey, Dylan, look at this, or hey, how do we work as a, as, a, as a team to get to the bottom of this? All right, we have boots on the ground. All right, hey, here's Spirit World. I'm doing the language, the linguistics, you know, the the yeah. fin, the the uh, philo philological, I can't say that word, but like looking at how everything is related in regards to the words. And it's just working as a unit. And then even just people like myself who isn't as um, is well versed in a lot of this stuff, but I'm learning is being able to show stuff to you like I did the other day. I've been like, hey man, I'm learning Japanese because my son's quarter Japanese. Check this out, man. 33 means Sanju San. Like, isn't that interesting? And then the symbolism that comes with it in regards to the, you know, the uh the culture and the in the the language as well. So well, you're doing that's the stuff that I can't like I'm not studying Japanese. So like you what that's the whole point of this is you will then take this and apply it to whatever you are doing. And your work will be that much more exceptional because you'll know what you're looking at. That's the whole point. I can't look at all this stuff. And I don't, I don't have the resources to go onto the ground, nor do I even want to go to India, really. It's not something that calls me. I don't really want to study all these other languages. I'm just putting it out there to show people that there is a system. And if you actually do the work, you can see it. And then those of you who are fluent, because one of the, here's the, one of the challenges about language. There are things like idioms that do not translate into other languages. And if you don't know how to have, like what that means, like, uh, what's a good one? If I asked you, Pat, you putt from the rough. Do you know what I'm saying? Say it again. Do you putt from the rough? I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So... In England, uh, sorry, in New England, <laughs> there's a, uh, that's a saying, are you gay? You putt from the rough? How are you going to, you can't even in a modern American climate translate that. So how is somebody 2000 years later going to know what the hell that is? Even if they know what the game of golf is. There's another one. I found out this because I live in a different part of the country now. And so I have all these things in my language that relate to old English because I'm from New England. I'm from one of the oldest parts of New England. And so one of the things I say when I go golfing is you want to hit the links, but out here, people have never heard that before. They don't know what that means. I'm like, what do you golf? I thought you golfed. And like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, you hit the links today. They have no idea. And it's because it goes back to the links in Scotland or something like, like in, in, in old English word, uh, old English terminology. So 
This is one of the challenges that if you don't have the mindset of that culture, you're gonna not gonna you, you're gonna have that much more difficulty in understanding the language, which is why we need to get people brought up to speed all around the world. The problem is this is work that really can't be done unless you're from a, a, a nation that's like uh, not in just survival mode, right? And that's the problem is a lot of these cultures that have all this uh, antiquity, this amazing, like rich history, they're barely surviving. So they don't have the luxury to do this work. You know, it's kind of like the tragedy of the Irish. The Irish didn't have the luxury to keep uh, a dictionary, right? They're fighting the fucking Danes. They're fighting the Saxons. They're fighting the English. They're fighting everybody just to survive because everybody, they, they were stationed. They happened to be in Albion. And, you know, it's like trying to be in Israel. You're not going to be at a trade hub of the world and live in peace. Because as soon as the empire that you had that had control of that is gone, they're not there to protect you. Everyone else is going to come in. So if you want to try to keep that land that you that you know you've grown up on and spending your family, it's not going to happen without war and without being able to defend yourself. So all that rich history that you know that would connect all the dots where most of us are looking for is not being recorded. And so we're losing that Irish language, which is a key because the Irish language comes from the Phoenician. Or if it doesn't, it just happens to be the same 17 letters that the Phoenicians gave to the Greeks. And if that story is um, even remotely true, that would be circa 500 BC. Um, but we were talking about like, uh, uh, Remember how, like in the pre-show, you're talking about like uh, series, you know, all those yep, like yep. The, the C words, right? Well, one of those is going to be, so we have Cyrus, but in that is going to be the same symbolism. Right. You could pronounce it as Kyrus, right? Or Chris, which is going to be the root of Christ, which means good in Greek. And it comes from Krishna in Sanskrit or Hindi over, over there, meaning black. So that's why these gods are black. Apollo, the black god. Osiris, the black god. Nimrod, you know, Kush, the Negro. You know what I mean? So they'll yeah. they'll tell you, oh, they're Negroes. <laughs> but that's like you're fucking missing right. the symbolism. Or even you put in the book to the Bach, the Bach, add the L. Now you have black. Black. So it's just showing yep. you. Isn't that wild? Add the L, add the, L, the power, add the, the strength. E -L, L, L. And, and just yep. shows you like, well, what is, they said, what is Bach? It's a stream. And this is what's so fascinating, and I've been going on rants about this, uh, a lot of the gravy with this symbolism of how much water in sun symbolism is in all of it across the board. And it's just then asking and begging the question, well, why? Like, what is the importance of water in the sun? Like, what is, why are we putting so much attention to that? So, I mean, do you want to maybe chime in on some of your thoughts of why, of, of its importance? I mean, we all know that, yes, okay, well, I've, yeah, I've gone over that in previous podcasts, so well, I don't want to- Can you wanna, maybe show where, you know, where people can find those specific ones then? Um, no, no okay. I can't okay, off the top no of my head, but but you just read the book. It's, yeah, it's, it's where people can find it, where people um, can pick them up. Yeah, so the I have three book series. They're available at every reputable online bookstore um, dealer in ebook form. But if you're going to get them through paperback, one way or another, it's going to come mm -hmm. from Amazon. So I, the best place is just to go to Amazon, just because if there's any, any yeah. issue, you can just, they're really good about returns or whatever. But uh, there's three, there's two series, and then there's one independent book. The series, the first series, I have fantasy that I really want to get back into. This is what I was doing before, like society started degrading so much that I had to do spirit world. But it was the tale of Onora, O-N-O-R-A. I, uh, gotten an online spat back in like 2016 or so. So I got like a cancel culture yeah. on me. So like, if you go to the landing page of book one, it's all going to be fake reviews. What they did is they left a bunch of fake reviews and then they all voted them up. So that's mm -hmm. all you see when you yeah. uh, go on the landing page or at Goodreads, they like left thousands of fake <laughs> reviews. So the, the ratings are destroyed, but um, the tale of Onora, O-N-O-R-A, and then Get Mad or Get Realistic, what I published earlier this year, and then Spirit World, that's W H. I R L E D. That is the series that I, that all this knowledge we did is is uh, the language and all that stuff. That's that's what's going to get you uh, get you upgraded there. 
and uh, it's available pretty much everywhere. And uh, Chance Garten did the, he's narrating book four right now, but he did book three as well. My friend uh, Emma did the books one and two, so they're in audiobook form as well. Um, but each format has its mm-hmm. use. The audio is going to help you with the sound. The Kindle book or the paperback will help you with the sight. Now, if you don't like reading online, then yeah, you want the paperback. But the the usefulness of the ebook is that you can use it like an mm-hmm. index and return to subjects to remind yourself or refresh yourself, especially if you're a researcher or especially if you're going to go on podcasts or you host podcasts. You can have my book up and just type the little thing, the the words in, and it'll take you to all the points in the word in the book in the manuscript, and then you can just go through them and make sure you're you're dialing it in. So each one has its uh, its usefulness, and so the best thing to do is if you're gonna get the audio book, maybe grab the ebook as well, just so you can like look at it and see what the what's. Because it helps that you got to see the pattern. You got to see the way the word's structured, but then you also mm-hmm. got to hear it because sometimes a word doesn't look the same, but it sounds yep. the same. A hundred percent, man. And I can attest to that by uh, reading some of this and then, but also listening to a lot of just our conversations off, off air and things, but also listening to your podcast is just hearing the repetition or even just playing around with it my own, just by myself, just seeing what that sounds like. Um, but dude, it's it's this is always a blast, man. I, and I, it's so informative, and just I, I'm so excited that you've you've great you know graced me with your time and this amount of attention because I know you're very particular My about pleasure. that. So I, I am very grateful for that, and I look forward to the fifth book, man. Um, but yeah, man. On that, everyone, thank you for joining us. Is there anything you want to leave people with before we? Yeah, if if you see value in this, if you enjoyed yourself. Click the like button, the share, and subscribe, whatever platform you're hearing this is, because we're all censored. So this is not going to get out there if you don't share it. So support Pat so he can reach bigger audiences and help more people. It's very simple. It costs you nothing. So if you can't support my work, right, and you just listen to the podcast, fine, but go sh- share it. Get it. Get Give the these podcasts a chance to get to other people who are in better financial situations or are more generous and want to help. Absolutely. You know, it's 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 not we're not going to get there if everybody just keeps this shit to themselves and just watches and then clicks it away. Oh, that was really fun and entertaining. Yeah. Now on to the next. Share it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Stop being lazy. And, yeah. Do the and work. That's as simplest work you can do is literally just use the same thumbs that you're doing what you're already doing and just having a little more purpose with the next uh, thumb motion instead of going and jerking off to porn yeah, quit yeah. that homosexual shit and go fucking share right. this get, podcast share the gravy. get mad and get <laughs> realistic oh man dude cue my yeah. outro boom <laughs> awesome man thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you all next all time right, thanks brother thanks for checking out our free preview of the podcast if you want to listen to the rest of this episode and many others like it become a member at thepatlife.org <laughs>